welcome to the D Tycoon Show. This is our weekly show, um, and it's brought to us by um, Catherine Brown, D Tycoon. And um, she ran for mayor and um, when I was running for 49th Ward Alderman. And um, we just uh, became friends, and that's why we're here. So welcome to the D Tycoon Show, where we talk about everything nonprofit, and we sometimes get into um, the nitty-gritty of politics really awesome here we go this is the contact information for mayor tycoon i call her mayor tycoon because uh she believes that um you know what we're called is what we will become and uh she called me alderman morton and it's first person ever say that and it was really a good time and it was really a nice surprise okay so i would like to start the show uh today um I was publishing a book, uh, North uh, Northeastern Illinois University, and I'll, I'll show you this one here, uh, Seeds, which is a um, literary and visual arts journal. Um, it's a pretty thick book by Northeastern Illinois University, and um, it's got just a whole bunch of uh, poetry, um, a whole bunch of um, stories, and it's got um, visuals. A lot of different uh, photography and other pieces of art, which is pretty interesting stuff. Um, so I want to show you my, my piece here for a second. Here we go. Here we go. There's my piece right there. Now this piece right here is actually a wall-sized um, print on vinyl that I did. Um, through uh, one of the print companies that I'm friends with. They were, um, they were good enough to uh, print it out for me and frame it for me, actually. It was amazing. And, um, and this one is of Leon Beach Park right here, which I am president of the advisory council, and other, other uh, portions of Rogers Park. I know it's kind of hard to see because it's small in this book, but um, this one is the one version, and this one here is are two versions in transparency. And I originally did this because um, I was inspired by Andrew De La Rosa. And he's, um, he's, he's a, a longtime friend of mine who, who passed away. And he was the head of Gallery B1E. And he inspired a lot of people to be creative and to um, become artists and, and release their artistic intention. And he invited me to um, be... Um, an artist and create this piece, a large, a large piece for the Activate uh, pop-up um, art show um, in the alley of the Chicago Theater. And uh, Andy and I were great friends. And now, um, now that he, he passed away, um, the, the the gallery is called the Rogers Park Art Gallery, and um, the Chamber Office is there. Uh, we have a little office in there, and uh, that's where you can find us. Um, I want to. Thank Northeastern Illinois University for including me in these fine pieces of work, and I'm really, um, I'm really thankful and honored to be a part of this. Real cool stuff here. All right. So, seeds. You can get this at, uh, I believe, for free at Northeastern Illinois University which is really great. Um, we are going to have a guest here today, um, Julius Mercer. Julius is um, a friend of mine, lives in Rogers Park, former Olympian. Uh, he told me that um, he was roommate with Jackie Joyner Kersey's brother, and um, he's, he's a Rogers Park resident, and I see him all the time um, around Morse Avenue, and um, he He'll tell his story today, um, how he, um, why he wrote his book, um, exactly what he went through, and um, how he's using his Olympian status uh, as an athlete, along with other uh, professional athletes from the Chicago Cubs, the White Sox, the Bulls, the Blackhawks, and other Olympians, um, to help people going through rough times, and doing fundraisers for people in need. So. Um, um, he's, he's really great, and um, I'm looking forward to him getting here. Uh, we have our monthly Rogers Park Job Fair coming up, and here's the information for this. 
Our monthly Rogers Park job fair is um, is um, once a month, and it is it features all kinds of employers, and it's 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 really interesting how how many employ uh, potential employers meet up with um, job seekers, and you know there's a discussion all the time out there that you know well where are the jobs? How come this person or this group of people can't find the jobs. Well, here are the jobs. This is a citywide job fair. It's hosted in Rogers Park. We call it the Rogers Park Job Fair, and it's hosted by the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce. Um, for more information, you can reach www.rogerspark.cc. We've had a lot of great employers, uh, for-profit and non-profit. I'm not going to mention them because uh, this is non-profit services. And um, I just wanted to invite everybody. Now, um, when it comes down to it, we need the employees to show up and we need the em potential employers to show up. So what we want to do is um, invite employers Go to rogerspark.cc, call 773-850-0049 if you're a potential employer, and um, participate. There's no fee, and there never is a fee. We just want to um, get people the jobs to the people who need it. And here is Julius Mercer. Hey, Bill, how's, how's going? it going? Nice to see you. Hey, likewise. Great. Likewise. Excellent. Thank you for coming. You got it. My so, pleasure. so I kind of did an introduction for you um, already about about your book, and uh, that that you're a Rogers Park neighbor, yes. and that you participated in Chamber of Commerce events and different things like that. And um, maybe maybe you can fill them in on the details. Yeah, I, I love Rogers Park, by the way, and it was a pleasure to meet you mm -hmm. upon shortly after my arrival there, about uh, three years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great great guy. Um, so yeah. Uh, where do I start in terms of... Start at the beginning. The right... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, uh, back in... in, in that, um, also, you might, you, if you have to interrupt me, it's okay to redirect me. Oh, I would. Okay, good. Don't worry about that. Yeah. So back in 1984, mm -hmm. actually 1983, uh, my life seemingly was at the top. You know, I just graduated from Kansas State University. I earned a bachelor's degree in sociology, uh, which was great because I overcame, I had to overcome some academic deficiencies that stemmed from uh, junior high school all the way up. Uh, in fact, when I graduated from high school, my grade point average was 1.65 mm -hmm. on a 4.0 scale. So uh, kudos to me for graduating, you know, with some mm -hmm. help from mentors. Um, and in addition to that, in 1984, I had qualified for the U.S. Olympic tryouts, which were held in Los Angeles, California. Mm -hmm. I ran track, of course. I ran the 110-meter hurdles and the low hurdles, the 400 low intermediate hurdles. I actually qualified, hit the qualifying standard in both races. Um, I didn't make the Olympic team, but I did try for the Olympic team in the low hurdles. Mm -hmm. I was ranked six in the U.S. And just before the Olympic trials, I had placed uh, second as an American in the NCAA Division I track and field championships in the men's low hurdles. And um, so things were going great, and I, I graduated. And then from that point on, I was coaching at the college level, Division I level. Uh, in addition to that, uh, then I sought uh, to be a social, social worker. Mm -hmm. You know, so things were going really good. And then about two years short, uh, after, I tried out for the Olympics. Uh, I had moved to Los Angeles, California, because I was offered to run on a, a track club in LA called South Bay Track Club. Mm -hmm. And and I had just gotten married, and I was like, wow, LA, go out there, you know, the fun, the, the stars, Hollywood. And so moved out to LA, and after being out there for about two years, you know, I was in great running condition, not on any drugs or nothing like that. But then uh, suddenly I woke up in a hospital, mm -hmm. the L.A. County Hospital, and the doctors had told me I tried to kill myself. So I had a suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. And um, Do you remember that? I, I don't remember exactly when it happened, 
but I'm, I'm blessed to be able to recall some of the things that was going on now, mm -hmm. and which today I know it, I'm, I've been diagnosed with what's called uh, schizoaffective disorder, which is, which is like a chemical imbalance that was triggered by me not managing fears and stressors in a positive way. So what would be a positive way to man manage your, your stress? To manage fears and stressors? Well, I have, number one, I see a therapist now. Mm -hmm. I see a therapist uh, located in beautiful Rogers Park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the therapist helps me to understand more about um, my sickness and then helps me to develop coping skills mm -hmm. to, so I can manage different things going on in my life where the stress doesn't take me over. So now, and I've been with this therapist for about four years, so I, I'm kind of like master it now. So I have some um, positive affirmation sticky notes in my house now that gives me a lot of faith and a lot of hope on a daily basis every time I live, I read them. Mm -hmm. And then um, I learned to do what's called compartmentalize, which I treat, um, one situation as that one situation and do not allow a negative outcomes or negative projections to for me to connect everything as one big thing happening so no avalanche oh avalanche good choice of word yeah and i learned to to be cautious where i don't burden the responsibility that someone else has because i'm an emotional person a caring person and for years being a social worker and like a track coach, I cared so much about people be having success that when they failed, I, I burdened the responsibility. I took it home with me. When they worried, I worried. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, call, I was causing more stress for myself. And, but today I learned to look at it like uh, that if I'm supporting someone in a situation, I have to know that they have a responsibility and I have a responsibility too. And all I can do is support them and hope and help them, but I can't do it for them. So where do you draw the line then? I draw, where do I draw the line? That It depends on the situation and circumstances. So different boundaries for different situations? Yeah, yeah for different people. Um, when situations start to affect me, then I have to draw the line right away. I have to draw the line. When it affects me in a bad way. If it affects me in a positive way, then it's okay. I, it's okay if I stick my, my neck out to support individuals. Um, but there are there are certain boundaries related to maybe if if depends on what the person is suffering from. Like say if it's an addiction, mm -hmm. then I have to draw a boundary where with me giving them money. Okay, um, I have to draw boundaries. I have to be aware if there's a pattern of manipulation. I have to be aware are they taking steps to do the right thing for themselves. And if they're not taking those steps, are, are, is that individual trying to manipulate me where I end up being a uh, co the co codependent? Mm -hmm. Where I'm actually helping them to get what they want in a negative way. Right. Yeah, so it depends on the circumstance situation. Now let's say it's a person with some mental health issues, but they don't have an addiction. We have a caller. Caller? Good evening. Hello. This sounds Hello, like... I have a question for your guest. This sounds like Bishop James Allen Wachowski, is it? Yes, it is. Hey, how you doing today? Good evening. I'm fine. I was very interested in what you were saying earlier, and I know that you've just really begun your interview with Bill. Uh, I'd like to know, based on your experiences, what recommendations would you have for the parents and families and the coaches who begin working with our young people, um, um, you know, the ones who are still in, um, you know, um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and those who feel that they have an attraction to athletic endeavors, but um, we see quite often that many of our young kids sometimes are treated the way professional athletes are. And, they have a lot of pressure uh, put on them from the earliest ages. What can we do to nurture our future athletes 
uh, to not only enjoy the, the sport that they, that they are involved in, but to help them to grow in, in the responsibilities and challenges without uh, imposing on them any um, short or long-term um, psychological harm. That's, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> I can only speak from my personal experience. You see, um, one, of the, one of the biggest things that I do when I go out and speak is I put emphasis with the parents is, is mentoring, having mentors. Because sometimes, sometimes parents think that they are the answers to their child's hopes, dreams, future in their life. But the parent may not be that person. It may be a mentor, as you know, Pastor. I, I'm sure in your life, Pastor, right? The bishop. Bishop, I'm sure, Bishop. I'm sure in your life many people have came to you and they felt like they couldn't talk to anybody else, right? And so so um, one of the things that I do is uh, I, would, I would speak to the parents. The parents have to, sometimes parents have to humble themselves and understand that there are people who have a little bit more experience in what they do that maybe they can reach their child in such a different way. And what, what I would like to do is, what I do is, is when I talk to kids in schools, is put emphasis on, if they're a student, if they're an athlete, is put emphasis on the importance of being a student athlete. Um, to put more emphasis on education, uh, that, let, let, teach them that education and, and athletics, they go hand in hand. And, and the other thing is, is that um, I've noticed over the past few, uh, past years, there's a lot of depression, a lot of suicidal ideologies that's happened to a lot of young kids in schools. And I, I believe that this, uh, a big part of this is equated to them um, um, not having the tools to deal with what they call mental health stigmas. And um, there are a lot of resources in the school systems, like counselors, um, the, the student advisors, and a lot of kids are reluctant to, to actually engage with those counselors and student advisors and, and to open up about some interpersonal issues they may be having. And for myself, like I suffer from a lot of interpersonal issues that actually distracted me from receiving more education in high school. Like for and it, this, and this interpersonal um, problems that I had um, affected my my self worth, the way I felt about myself. And because I was unequipped to, or had the uh, someone to steer me to understand the value of speaking to mentors, coaches, teachers, pastors, etc., to get some inside help about myself, then I end up suffering in silent ways for many, many years in many different facets of life. Not only just school, but in relationships, engaging with people, um, and and it just stagnated my true potential of who I. Who I ha who I could become. Well, thank you so very much for for your insight and your hope for our young uh, athletes who will uh, uh, someday bring pride not only to Chicago but uh, to the to the uh, rest of our country. And thank you for being an example and a witness for all of us. I really appreciate it. Thank you too, Bishop. All right, thank you, Bishop Olkowski. Um, you can call in too at the number. Right down there, 312-738-1060. Um, if, if you're watching the live version, if you're watching on YouTube or the pre-recorded version, then no. Um, we, you can uh, contact uh, Mayor Di Tycoon, though, anytime you like at this information. All right, so um, let's, let's get through uh, a, couple, a couple quick questions. Sure. Um, what inspired you to hurdle? Well, at the age of 16, maybe going on 17, I was a junior in high school. I went to a high school called uh, Richie's High School in Park Forest, Illinois, which mm -hmm. is a south suburban community. 
And so I grew up in a family of four boys and one girl. Two of my older brothers, um, they had ran on our high school track team. Uh, one was uh, a triple jumper and a long jumper. And the triple jumper, he set a record at the school. And then my elder brother, um, he ran the hurdles, and he was like a just an all-around athlete. And then uh, during that time, I played baseball and I played basketball. Mm -hmm. And then he came to me and he says, Julius, you should go out for the track team. So I, I did. My junior year, I, when they called track practice, I went out. And I had this coach, his name was Johnny Meisner, who also was a counselor at the time. And so Johnny Meisner, I didn't know nothing about track. As soon as I stepped on the track, Johnny Meisner said, hey, Julius. He said, you ever jumped a hurdle? I said, no. So he pulled out a hurdle, put it on the track, and he said, jump over that. And I jumped over that, the hurdle. And he said, you're going to be a hurdler. That's got to hurt. I've seen those hurdles. Yeah, absolutely. It hurts if you fall. And I fell a couple times. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Especially back in, this was like 19... Uh, 78 and and our tracks the running tracks was made out of cinder it, it wasn't the all-weather rubber tracks that they have nowadays mm -hmm. so that cinder when you fall in the cinder it'll skin your your legs up and, and your leg look like a raw hamburger wow was your coach your mentor yes the coach yeah he was my mentor he taught me how to hurdle he put a dream and vision in my head that I never saw before and um, so my junior year, uh, I, I didn't win very much. I ran, but I learned how to run the hurdles. Now the next year, my senior year, now there's two types of hurdle races that I mentioned earlier, the high hurdles and the low hurdles. So my senior year, I was undefeated in both hurdle races for the entire season. And then at the, we had a, um, at the end of the season, we, I ran in the meet called the Districts. Mm -hmm. And then I was the high hurdle district champion. I set a school record uh, there, which still stands to, which still, I set a school record in the high hurdles, and in the low hurdles, I set a school record that still stands today so your since pictures. 1977 mm -hmm. at Richie's High School. So your picture's still on the wall up there. Yeah, still on the wall there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, when you were in Los Angeles, and you, you was it the, the, the party scene? They triggered your breakdown? No, 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 no. It was more like, uh, you know, like in, in Chicago, as I'm in Chicago, for example, because I live here now. But you know, a lot of gang violence, gunshots. I hear them in Rogers Park when I first moved there. I don't hear them, hear them as much now. You know, there, there's been a lot of talk about gun violence and traumatic stressors, right? Mm -hmm. So this was the beginning of my issue. So when I moved to Los Angeles, I had no idea where I was moving. So I had to move to an area where my wife and I, we, we weren't working at the time, so we had to move into an area where the rent was low until we get on our feet. Mm -hmm. So we moved right in the south central Los Angeles. Uh, if anybody's familiar with Los Angeles, we moved in an area called 104th and Prairie Avenue, right next to the airport. And the place was inundated with gang violence at the time. It was 1987, 88. It was about a couple of years before the, the infamous Rodney King beatdown was going on. So there was a lot of things going on. There were gangs at war, the Crips and the Blood. So this, it was an environment I wasn't used to because for the past six years, I was in the state of Kansas in a rural country town, mm -hmm. you know, going to junior college, went to Kansas State. And it was just really slower, a lot different life. And then suddenly I moved to the inner city. And then um, there were just gunshots every night and crips in the bloods and gang violence shooting. Then I would see police brutality, you know, police chasing people in the streets. I'd see them, beating them down. And, and uh, this was, it really affected my mind. I couldn't believe the violence that I saw. The, uh, uh, Hearing gunshots up close, boom, 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 live. Um, I started fearing for my wife. Every when I leave to go to work, I was always worried that I hope something would happen to my wife. Somebody wouldn't break in the house. Uh, she wouldn't get shot. And then um, a, few, a few months after I was there, my brother-in-law he uh, he got killed by some gang members. 
you know, he, it was a robbery and he ended up getting killed. So all this was affecting me. So I was, I was literally living day by day with a bunch of fears on the inside, but I didn't want to tell anyone. So you experienced PTSD? Uh, you could say that's what it was. And, uh, and so it triggered some psychosomatic issues. I had psychosis where, where um, one day I just was driving down the street. And then, um, and then when the psychosis hit, I can explain it to you now because now I know what it's, what it's like, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I had parked my car and I looked up. There was some helicopters hovering above in L.A. And now in Los Angeles, there's helicopters for news and there's also a lot of helicopters that chase people. Right? So when I saw these helicopters, I thought they were chasing me. This is what psychosis does. It's like extreme paranoia. It made me feel like they were chasing me. So I parked my car. I got out and I ran, must have ran about a mile or so. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to my house. And then I, I knocked on the door. And my wife answered the door and says, well, What's wrong with you? And I said, The police are there. They're trying to kill me. The gangs, everybody's trying to kill me. Now I had the same symptoms as if a person was hooked on heavy drugs and then someone says, oh wow, they're going crazy on drugs. But I wasn't on no drugs, this was happening, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so I thought that, I felt like everybody was trying to kill me and then uh, uh, I better kill myself before they kill me. And then the thing that I remember is that I pulled a garbage can uh, next to a, like a clothesline in someone's backyard. Mm -hmm. And I took off my coat, and that's all I remember. Yeah, I, was, I woke up in the hospital. The doctors asked me, uh, did I know where I was at? And I told them, now, by this time, the psychosis had settled, okay? So now I'm back to normal. The doctor says, do you know where you're at? And I says, yeah. I'm at uh, McLaren Children's Center. Mm -hmm. You see, because that's where I was working. I was working with abandoned and abused youths. They said, no, you're not. You're in the hospital. You try to kill yourself. And I went, what? You're crazy? Mm -hmm. I would never try to kill myself. So then they showed me a mirror, and I had a black mark around my neck. Oh. Yeah, I started crying. And my mom and dad had flew out there, and mm -hmm. everyone thought I was on drugs. And, and it turns out, you know, of course I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then everyone was perplexed. And so uh, that, that was the beginning. All right. We've got a couple minutes left. I just want to get through a couple different things. Are you an advocate for mental health centers? Yes. Uh, I've been hired about a year ago. I took some leadership and training at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, Illinois, mm -hmm. 35th in state. And uh, I got hired. I'm hot. Today what I am, I'm what's called a lived experience health researcher for those with serious mental illness, health disparities. So I work with professors and it's like this new breakthrough research where you take lived experience people who have managed their lives and back in remission, mm -hmm. and we work with professors to better our research. So I'm a very strong recruiter. I uh, face to go through the south side of Chicago, uh, west side of Chicago, because Chicago doesn't have a lot of resources. And so we, we recruit people in, and then we have focus groups mm -hmm. so we can better pr provide better health care uh, for people that are suffering like I did. Excellent. This is author Julius Mercer. And I'd love to have you back again sure. sometime soon, Julius. Sure, Bill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.